My talk today really is about a, a new approach to first responder training and uh, I base this on a number of reasons really because um, over the years and indeed even, even during this, the, the discussions we've had here, certainly I would say that some of you would consider that the definition of a first responder is a little bit too narrow and my own, my own opinion is that it's definitely time for a change and that the change that I'm talking about is to broaden the base, broaden the experience level of first responders. There probably isn't anybody in this room that doesn't recognize the importance of the first responder in the first place and the intervention in the field. And this is key because often um, people would consider that a first responder can be uh, just a bystander or something like that, well, that bystander probably isn't going to be much good unless they've received training. And unless they've received training in the complete set of skills that are required for a recovery, say, of somebody from the water, somebody walking up a mountain. And for instance, you might be the best person at CPR in, 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 on the planet. But if you're not able to take the person out of the water because you haven't developed or haven't received the necessary training or one thing or another, you're probably never going to get to practice your CPR skills. And similarly, if you're able to retrieve the person but you, you, you're not bringing a ray game on the CPR side or the packaging side or post that, you're probably going to be missing the mark as well. So what I'm proposing to do is really to start it off and say, well, what is a first responder? We have this term when we bandy it around and we say, first responder, um, we need a first responder as a one around. Well, what is a first responder first? What, what, what's this person supposed to do? And if you look at a lot of the definitions, and you can read away, I'm not really going to go over them, you can see that a lot of the definitions, the FEC, that's the Pre-Hospital Emergency Care Council in Ireland, that would be their, their definition of a first responder, emergency first responder. The other one is my favorite, Wikipedia, which always gives me an answer to something, whether it's right or wrong. But it, it narrows it down again, and it says, but it, it always comes back sort of to the medical side. It always says, you know, you've got to have skills. Now, the, the FEC one does say additional knowledge and additional skills. Well, that's great, but what additional knowledge and what additional skills? Now, I work with a number of groups and a number of people who would be on the same page as me. Now, I know some people aren't on the same page as me, um, but we sort of have come up with a, a definition of what we think a first responder should be. And, that, and I am going to read this one because a first responder is any person. That's the first thing. It's any person. It doesn't have to be, you know, who is capable of intervening in the field. So they've got to be capable when an emergency arises. So I'm not just talking about drowning. I'm talking about any emergency. Um, that might be a, a child swallowing a god gobstopper or something like that. I'm just talking about that. In such a way so as to positively contribute within their level of ability and the available resources. Because if you're in the field, you know, it doesn't matter what gizmos, what shiny objects they have in the hospital, you don't have those in the field. And to the best possible outcome, you can only do as much as you can do with what you have and your level of training. So. I think that's a much better definition. Um, I would like some of you maybe to take that definition away and, and use it. I would be quite happy about that. But I feel at the moment, whether with first responder training, with, it reminds me a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, one of these th thousand piece jigsaw puzzles that you buy. And everybody wants to do the castle in the middle of the puzzle because that's the bit they like. And it's, but when it comes to the sky and every bit looks the same, and people say, oh, well. And that jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle sits on the table for months with the sky never done, but the castle completed. And I think that's where we, where we really are, <coughs> excuse me, with first responder training. Um, and I think currently, and, and, I, and I say this within my experience level, is that first responder training often lacks context. It, is sometimes too narrowly focused. It is, um, it often, and I've seen this time and time again, lacks ground truthing. Um, it's all very well to do it in a nice warm classroom on a Wednesday afternoon with the central heating on, but you take that same person out and you, and you get them to do exactly that um, somewhere else in the field and it doesn't kind of work out so well. In some cases, the, 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 the taught approaches simply don't work in the field. And 
I, unless, and I, I'll put a caveat there, unless there's significant training in the process of that, and that might be from throwing a, a throw bag or whatever it is. And then sometimes first responder training is confusing for people, especially if they come back. I mean, if you have occupational first aid in this country, you go and do your occupational first aid over three days, then two years later, you come back and do a bit more. Well, I guarantee you most people in this room, including myself, will have probably forgotten what you did two years previously. And I think what we really need to look at it is we need to say, really, what, well, what does it have to be? Well, it has to be in my mind, and it has to be in, in, in my colleague's mind. It has to be relevant, relevant to the situations in which you work. It has to be applicable. In other words, you have to be able to apply it. It has to be holistic in focus, so I want to get that person out, I want to treat them, I want to package them, I want to send them away. I want to do the whole thing, I want to have that knowledge, that skills base to do that. I just don't want to be able to do one little bit. It must be implementable, it must be understandable. If I don't understand what I'm doing, then I'm going to have a problem when the balloon goes up. It must be all inclusive, and it, overall, it must be effective. So what I'm doing, it must have a positive, or as, to, as much as I can do, um, to have a positive outcome. Okay, so really where did we come, where did I come to this, um, not a eureka moment, but to this approach? And I suppose it all started 22 years ago. I joined a law enforcement, a fisheries agency, uh, 22 years ago. And prior to that, I'm, I'm a marine biologist, oceanographer, and my PhD is in sustainable development of biological systems. Absolutely, you'd say, probably very little to do with this. And you'd be right. Of course you'd be right, but this law enforcement agency, this fisheries law enforcement agency I joined, um, I found out that when I arrived, um, a little while before I had, they lost four officers in the course of their duty. They, they, um, five of them went to sea and only, only one came back. So this was a, a sea change for this organization. and. Because I've, have a, I've had a lot of experience in, in the marine environment before I joined the fisheries, I was tasked with implementing a lot of what the standard operating procedures were after, as you can imagine, the investigation into why these officers died. So we looked at that and we took all this advice and um, then we started this journey. And this, this is really the journey we're talking about. And I know Kevin mentioned that he's never pulled anybody from the water who was a non-swimmer. Well, I've been surfing for over 40 years. I have never seen anyone drown. The worst I've seen is one shoulder dislocation and a number of fin cuts and, and a bit of reef cuts. And I've surfed all over the world. So um, I'm not sure who's drowning because they're not, the, they're not the people I see either. So the training that I did have, though, or I do have in, in, um, in, in the academic world would have taught me how to problem solve. So here we had a problem, and, and the goal was we never want to see this happen again. That was the goal. And you can understand the reason why you would have a goal like that after you're losing, losing four officers at sea. And so how do you do, about, how, how do, you go about doing that? And for me, the, the obvious way was through a systems approach. Now, a systems approach is no more than putting all the parameters into a big hat, making sure you've got all those parameters into a big hat, taking them all out, putting them together, and then making sense of them and say, okay, well, that's how we're going to do it. And that model looks really complex, but it's not. All it's saying is get all these parameters, put them in. Don't miss any, you know, don't miss any of these holes. So, for instance, when we, when we did that, we, we decided, okay, and, and here's one that you probably would relate to, and I, I know I spoke to Linda about this earlier on, is that if I put a bucket on the floor here and I gave every one of you a pebble, and I asked you, well, I can't move, but I asked you to throw your pebble into the bucket, and I put 10 euros, I'm cheap, I put 10 euros over there as a bet to see how many would get the pebble in the bucket. How many do you think would get it in? From where you're sitting now, stand up, underarm, pebble in the bucket. How many? <laughs> very few, I would say. I would say very few of you would get anywhere near the bucket. Some of them would probably hit me, and some of them might go in the screen. Okay. That's where they'd end up. And the point of that is, is that you're often given a throw rope, and you say, put that throw rope in your boat, put that throw rope in your car, and use that throw rope if somebody falls in. And we've also run that experiment where we got all these throw ropes and said, okay, there's the person in the water, throw the throw rope. 
Well, those throw ropes went every, everywhere, you can think. Now, some of them did, you know, some of them went home, but the more they practiced, the better they got. Now you pull that object along the wall, you know, through the water, they're in a current. Now you make them go further out. A throw rope has 20 meters of rope line in it. That's a long way to throw. That's a long way to throw a, a, a bag of rope. So, so that's really what we did. And this has been the continuous process that we've used for all of our, our trialing, all of our um, drilling, I suppose you'd call it, is we identify and we analyze the exposures. So what would be the exposure for, for our guys who go to sea? There would be numerous ones. There'd be weather, there'd be tides, there'd be getting to the water, because they launch the boats using ribs down slippery slips, and they're covered in weed, and then we could have adverse weather conditions, etc. That The list is endless. But what we tried to do was we tried to simulate all of those and then drill them. So there's no point saying, OK, well, we'll get the guys to do this. So the example of the, of the throw ropes was a very real one, because not only did the fishery officers um, that I would have worked with go to sea, they spend most of their time in pairs walking up rope rivers. So a, using a throw bag is really, really important that they can do that, because there's two guys, and you know, definitive care, one hour, an ambulance isn't going to get to most of them in an hour from where they'd be working in Kerry or somewhere like that. So it's important that they have those skills, but they only have those skills when they, when they continue to use them and practice them. And this is going to be another issue I'm going to talk about in a minute, is how often do you practice those skills? Because I mentioned OFA, say, go on the three-day course, you go on the three-day course, you do this, come back two years later, we give you another certificate. <coughs> And, you know, the organization has ticked the box. They're quite happy. They've ticked the box, so, so they're okay. But how skillful is that person? And how broad and how applicable is that? So when we started this journey 22 years ago, we said, okay, well, how are we going to do that? And a number of us, we, we did, a, we did a, a sort of a medical side. We did, a, we did an operations side. We did a, a non-technical skill side. So it's not only any good becoming all of these things. And we, and we you know, we, we basically, we become all of these things. But, you know, things like communication. How do you supply support services to somebody? These are things that you're not, sometimes not taught. So we really try to be holistic in our thinking and say, OK, well, we're going to make sure that we can drill down. And we, I mean, I'm a remote EMT with ACLS, et cetera. And that, those skills we trans transfer across and say, OK, well, that's the, that's the CPR side. That's that bit. So now let's try and get the recovery side. So we looked at it. And we looked at, OK, man manual handling. And OK, a, a quick example of that. We would, have had, we would simulate exercises with one group that I work with. Um, let's say I'm out surfing with, I'll use you again, Linda. I'm out surfing with Linda. And we're out there together, remote beach. Um, Linda's bought a ray game on the CPR, okay, but, you know, she, she, she loses me in the surf. She comes in, she finds me face down in six inches of water. What does she do? Well, <laughs> isn't it 30 minutes good? You're sharp. Um, so what does she do? Well, she's been taught that she has to take me up the beach and she has to do that. Well, Linda, I weigh 92 kilos, a 6'4", wetsuit is another five kilos, a pair of booties is a kilo. I'm close to 100 kilos now. Linda's not a big lady. You know, she's going to find it hard to move me up the beach. So what techniques could Linda be taught to move me 100 kilos from the surf zone enough, far enough up the beach in order to actually be able to do anything with me? Okay, so those skills are there. Those skills are out there. We can, you know, you can, you can learn those skills. But if you don't know them, then there's a problem. Because the problem is, is that when that balloon goes up, when she sees me face down in the water, she knows she has to protect my airway. But now all the other training she had was on the Wednesday afternoon in the classroom with the central heating on. Now, that's a problem. That's a big, big problem in first responder training. Um, we also had concurrently a technological revolution within fisheries because of this. We started off 22 years ago with next to no equipment, um, and there would be a, a large body of thought out there who would say, OK, we can solve this problem with technology. All right, And to a degree, they are correct. You can save. Um, you can contribute to the process with technology. There, are, there is a big problem here, because what I would say to you with technology is, is that, yes, it has a place, but it is inclined to dilute 
human skills. It's inclined, it's inclined to dilute your skill set and dilute your awareness. And here's a bowl of water on the, on, the, on the screen here. And if I said to you, I want you to tell me within 10 degrees how hot or cold that water is in that bowl. Well, you would use a number of your skills that you have, your life skills. So you would look at the bowl for a start and you would say, well, that bowl's glass, that bowl conducts heat. You would say that. I believe you would say that. You would also look at the bowl and say, well, there's no steam coming out of it. Okay, so it's not boiling. You'd look at the bowl, well, there's no bubbles coming up, so it's probably not boiling. There's no ice crystals in the bowl, so it's probably not frozen. So you've made a number of determinations and you haven't even gone near the bowl yet, all right? Now, you would say, okay, what am I going to do now? Well, I could probably turn my hands over and touch the edge of the bowl like that with my hands, and I can see, and I can pull them away really quickly if it's, if it's hot. Well, you do that, and you find, well, that's not too hot. And after a while, you go through all of these things, and you put your hand over the water, and you put your finger in the water and say, yeah, well, okay, that's, about, that's like a cup of tea or something like that. Okay, now we do the same thing, and I say to you, okay, I'm going to, supply, uh, you know, I'm going to apply the technology here. And this is a bit of a labored example, but it, it, I, think it, I think it demonstrates it. I give you three pairs of gloves. Now, those gloves are going to protect your hands. They're going to be really, really good at protecting your hands. Now, I ask you the same question. I say to you, how warm is that water? Now, all of those life skills that you've had, you can only use some of them now, because now you've lost... You've got your sight, you've got, maybe you've got your smell, but you're losing some of those skills. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, a lot of you would be sailors, a lot of you would be um, boats people. You go onto a boat now, and you see how many people are using electronic charts, and they don't even have on board any paper charts, navigation charts, or that the ones that they have on board aren't in date. Now, you would be really surprised, because I meet people all the time they have a, a Garmin GPS on their boat, and they just follow nautical charts on this. I mean, if I said to you, do you think it's a good, sensible thing to bring your television and put it onto, into a boat in a wet environment? I think you'd probably tell me it's not. And, but that's the risk you're taking, you, you, because that's an electronic device, and electronics and water, as far as I've ever been able to sort out, they, they're not really compatible. So we banged this drum, and believe me, we banged this drum a long, long time. Um, for the last 10 years, we've been banging this, and we've been saying, well, okay, let's, let's have this holistic approach. Let's do this. Let's see if it's going to work. And we've been, we, you know, we've given every excuse under the sun. It's going to be too expensive. It's um, too difficult to implement. You require too much training. Our guys will be away from, the, from their core duties for too long. All of these reasons, and all of them are valid. You know, I can't argue with those reasons. But that doesn't mean to say because something is difficult, you shouldn't do it. I mean, walking or climbing up Everest is difficult, but people do it. You know, swimming the channel is difficult, but people do it. So whether that's a good enough excuse to say, no, it's, you know, it's not, we're not going to do it because of those reasons, I don't think they're valid reasons. I think if we keep doing that, we're going to keep doing the same old thing year on year. And that's why we're saying we've got to change it, because we believe if the mindset changes, it is possible to do that. But we said to ourselves, okay, well, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe we're wrong. Maybe, you know, we're skewed as to what we're thinking. Maybe it's just not the way to go. And here enters the controversy, because what we decided to do was we said, okay, well, let's, let's test all the reasons that they said. And the sort of reasons that we were given, they were, the reasons were, um, oh, well, they get lots of experience from the workshops and conferences they attend. Well, hunky-dory. Um, online learning, you know, this is a brilliant source, and it is a good source for learning, and I would agree that, that in some cases it is. Okay, we'll send them on courses once in a while, and that'll be really good for them. They can study the scientific literature, and we've had some good academic discussions here today, and that's true as well. And we'll look at, we'll actually review somebody who we think probably is doing this already, and we, we decided to, you know, have a look at the Irish lifeguard training system here and say, okay, well, are they doing this? These are beach lifeguards on the beach. Let's, let's see what, what happens. So the first thing we did was we, we did the workshop and conference learning. And this is the controversy, and it is still very controversial. But um, I attended a conference this time, about this time last year in France, and 
part of the conference was an on-beach session in which I, I, I deliberately did some pretty appalling CPR, expecting at any moment for someone to say, look, that's not really how you should do this. Um, we didn't get any, I didn't get any feedback. Another one of my colleagues said, um, or went to a mass exercise, a mass training exercise, and he did some very substandard um, secondary surveys on the casualties that they had. And the third, my third colleague, he went there, he went to another training exercise, and they were less than perfect casualty reports that he wrote. All of those very significant, serious bits of, bits of the puzzle, if you want to look at it like that. Um, none of us received any, any correspondence. So what we did was we wrote to all of the organizers, and this is obviously here, so you can imagine where the controversy came in. Um, we wrote to the, all the organizers and told them what, what we'd done, and, and it was an observational thing. Um, now, fair dues to the guys in, in France, the conference that I went to, they wrote back and said, yeah, well, look, we recognize there are issues with, with our practicals on, you know, on the beach and one thing or another. So I was very pleased with that. We've yet to hear from the other two parties. So um, all I can say is I think that, uh, I, I think it was a very interesting exercise whether we should go do it again. I'm not sure. But it certainly has pointed out that if they didn't pick us up, who else haven't they picked up? What other parts of it haven't they picked up? So from the, the takeaway message for me from that is checks and balances, guys. If you don't have those checks and balances in, then you, you run the risk of things just slipping through the cracks and people basically walking away thinking they're competent when, in fact, they're, they're not. Um, online learning, I learn lots of things online. I learn how to take the carburetor out of a car you know, on, 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 on with YouTube. It's brilliant, okay? It's really good. And there are some excellent um, videos on everything you can possibly think of on there. So we looked at it and we said, okay, well, how much learning could you do online? Well, I think you can do quite a lot, providing that there's a caveat there that you're very careful in what you look at and that it's peer-reviewed or it's, it, it's, it's, it's accepted as, a, as mainstream and norm. So we said, okay, well, what do we got here? We got Let's look at Bondi Rescue, and Bondi Rescue is, I'd say, <clears throat> globally accepted as being, you know, pretty cutting edge. It's Australian, guys, and uh, sorry about that, but, you know, it's, it's accepted as being, as, as being, it's also free for view if we look at any of the clips on, on that, so that was important too, so, um, and it's very well known. And I think what I want to show you here now is I want to show you two clips, so you could go on. The point is, is that let's say you're there, you've done your own occupational first aid or emergency first responder, and you want to brush up on it yourself. Now you're going to go on and you're going to look at the guys, as far as you're concerned, because they're on Irish TV every single day, um, the guy, these guys doing the correct procedures. So you go on and you start, and you watch this one first. And then it's down to
Okay, I'm now going to show you another one that's immediately after that one on YouTube. If you search drowning resuscitation Bondi Beach or something, I can't remember exactly what we used for that. But I'm going to show you the next one. Now, the, I'm not criticizing any of these, and they're all datable if you go on and you can see the dates on them, the date of publishing. But um, the next one is this one. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop that there, but I think the point is, and all of you saw, know the differences between all of the, the, those two videos that you saw there, okay? I mean, there were lots of differences between them. The point is, for the person who isn't knowledgeable, do you consider then, is that a good training medium for that person? So you can go on, you can go on to, you can go on to YouTube and you can search, I'm going to search drowning, uh, resuscitation, and you see two different techniques being used. Now, that's all very well to see two different techniques being used, providing that you know the, the publishing date. And this is one of the things that we really found, not only for this, but for the treatment of hill walking injuries and everything else, is the production date often doesn't match the publication date. Okay, so you could be looking at some CPG, clinical practice guideline of 15 years ago, but it's only just been published. Some guy put it up there. There's no peer review. There's no policing of what goes on to YouTube. So that would be the, the, the warning message is that I think it's very important. I think it's a very good learning so source, but I think there are uh, difficulties for people who go on and just think they're going to learn it from, from there. So the next, the next one we looked at was really short courses. Um, and we, this was very much an in-house thing in the fisheries where we employed external contractors to give various courses. Now, within the public sector, and a lot of you probably, I think, work in the public sector, there's one thing that accountants look at, and when you go to tender, that's the price, not necessarily the quality of the service. Okay, so it is extremely difficult to justify an extra 40% on top of the cost when some guy's charging you 1,000 bucks and the other guy's charging you 1,400 bucks to do, um, to deliver a course. So you have to have very, very good reasons of why you are using the more expensive one. Now, we have, we found that in order to become an OFA instructor in Ireland, you need to go on an OFA course, and then you need to go and do a week. So technically, you could become an OFA instructor in two weeks, and you could come back and deliver OFA courses in the public domain. Now, the difficulty with that is, is that you might have no background in that. On the other hand, you might get somebody who's extremely knowledgeable, and we've had really, really good guys and girls coming in and saying, okay, and they have a wealth of information, delivering exactly the same course. And I think that we've, we managed to get over it and we get around it because what we used to do is in the tender documents that we issued, we specified how much training and how much background those people needed. But it's, it, we certainly didn't do it in the beginning, and I think we came short because of that, that we had some people whose um, delivery of those courses were not what they should be. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember as well. 
On the scientific literature side, we, we looked at this and, we, and there's such, such a wealth, obviously, of scientific literature on, on drowning and everything else. But one of the things we found where um, first responders were involved, um, and I talked to a number of lifeguards about this, and we ground truth a lot of it actually with lifeguards, including the, the clips you saw a minute ago. And I said to them, you know, do, do, will you understand it and, and one thing and another? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's the kind of answer you get from a 20-year-old. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they don't want to, they, they basically don't want to give you the real answer. So we decided never to do any interviews. We had conversations. So as soon as we called it an interview with these people, uh, it, it was the party line or it was, it was, yeah, we understand. But when it was just a chat, it was, we, got, we got much better feedback from these guys. So we looked at the scientific literature and we said to them, okay, I got a paper just the other day, and, and it's, look, it's, it's from the Wilderness Medical Society and a uh, highly respected, um, obviously, publication and one thing or another, so an organization indeed. And when I read the, the publication I, 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 about, about um, in-water rescues, we started talking again about pulse checking. Pulse checking. And this is 2016, and I'm thinking, well, hang on a second. If I go to Resus Org UK, we're into not breathing, or we're breathing, you know, we're talking about, in this case, we're talking, they're not very easy to see, um, not breathing normally, um, and now we're back into pulse checking. And then I went back a year into the Wilderness Medical Society publications and saw exactly the same thing, not breathing normally. The pulse check thing just came in. Well, everybody in this room, um, if you swim out 100 meters, I would say to pretty much or most of you in this room, if you swim out 100 meters and you get to your casualty and it's a real casualty situation, you try and find a carotid pulse in a four-foot swell. And I, I wish you luck there because we've tried to do it in fairly flat water. Ah, it's a nightmare. It's a, you know, I, I, you're just going to waste your time doing it. I, and that's my own personal opinion. I think it's a retrograde step to start looking for pulses. Um, when really what that person needs is respiration. He needs, that person needs oxygen. So whether you give them in water rescue breasts, take them out beyond the break or whatever, however you do it, um, if you start looking for that. So, so that was confusing. So I said to the lifeguards, what do you draw from that? And they were confused. They didn't know what to say. They, and that's the problem. If you confuse people when you're trying to train them, um, that's not good. I taught in a school, I taught 16-year-olds chemistry for three years when I was doing my master's degree. And chemistry is boring at the best of times for 16-year-old boys, let me tell you that. So you had to try and make it exciting, and you had to try and make it very understandable. And I think that's where we are with this and lifeguards. We said to them, okay, well, what do you, th what do you think? And they said, well, we're not really sure now. And I think what's necessary here, and it's not sort of my role, it's the, it's the role of people like Mike Tipton and, and Linda and others who, and who sit on um, various committees to try and make this as understandable and as consistent internationally as possible. Because if I have one set of guidelines in America, one set of guidelines in um, the UK, and they're conflicting, I've got a problem. Which ones, do I, which ones do I use? Now, it's all very well when you're here and you're saying, well, I, you, know, you have all this experience, but these guys don't. First responders, by and large, don't. You're trying to teach them a whole wealth of, um, uh, of endeavors, and you're trying to make sure that they understand what you're saying. So if we could just be consistent across the board, I think that would be a great, a great bonus for everybody in the, in the training side. So then the last one we looked at was we just looked at, okay, well, how are the Irish lifeguards trained under Irish water safety? And um, th they are very myopic. They're, they're, they're very, very narrowly focused in that they can all swim really well and they can get around the boy and they can get a paddleboard and paddle out and paddle back really quickly. Um, but they don't even have an occupational first aid training requirement in, in Ireland for a lifeguard. So. Um, we would have our, our office space staff would be higher qualified um, in first aid than, than Irish lifeguards would be. And I don't really want to dwell on that because that's obviously a very political thing as well, but um, I think that's certainly something that needs to be looked at. And uh, so in conclusion, um, we consider, and I'm sure maybe some of this applies to some of you guys, that we consider the focus in Ireland just too narrow on first responders, these people who we hope are going to make a difference. Um, and that there is a very real requirement to empower first responders 
so they're able to function in various scenarios. I think that's our responsibility here, guys. I think, you know, if you're going to get asked someone to do a job, make sure you give them the right tools to do it. Thank you very much.